We've been to all four corners of Britain in our quest to interview the great and good of entertainment. Comics, actors, writers, politicians, singers, dancers and choreographers. It doesn't matter who they are. They've all given me their own take on the world they live in and have, in their own way, helped to define what makes Britain great. So join me and my assistants as we get another insight into the marvellous and enigmatic world of showbiz here on Beyond the Title. Former actor turned writer, director and producer Jonathan Lynn made his West End acting debut in the stage production of Green Julia before appearing in and writing television sitcoms, including the television comedy series Twice a Fortnight with Graham Garden, Bill Oddie, Terry Jones, Michael Palin and Tony Buffery. A writing union between Lynn and satirical stalwart Anthony Jay resulted in the hugely successful sitcom Yes Minister, followed by Jim Hacker's seemingly inevitable route to number 10 in the subsequent series Yes Prime Minister. I caught up with the veteran playwright to talk satire, films and recollections on an unparalleled career within the arts. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr Jonathan Lynn. As an actor, you trod the boards of the West End, making your theatrical debut in the stage production of Green Julia. How did this experience inform your later roles as a writer and director? Well, um, as a writer, not really. I haven't thought about being a writer then, uh, except the odd sketch when I'd been in the Cambridge Footlights. Uh, it wasn't my professional debut. It was my professional debut in the West End as a straight actor. But I'd been in Cambridge Circus on Broadway and then subsequently off Broadway. And then I worked in regional theatre in Coventry in Leicester. And uh, then I got the opportunity to do Green Julia at the, at the Travers Theatre in Edinburgh. And it was a success. It continued to uh, into the festival and got such good reviews that it was brought to London. How did it affect my 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 writing uh, when I wasn't doing any? And how did it affect my directing? Is that what you were asking? Yeah. Um, well, I haven't thought of being a director either. So I, all I can say is that being an actor um, does teach you a lot about writing. It's not a coincidence that a great many good playwrights have been actors. Mm -hmm. uh, Harold Pinter, John Osborne, Alan Akebourne, um, Alan Owen, um, Goldsmith, Sheridan, Shakespeare. Uh, being an actor teaches you about making a good entrance, making a good exit, and how to write that. Uh, it teaches you to, to write dialogue that actors can say. Some playwrights write unspeakable dialogue. Um, but so as I think as an actor, it does train you to write plays and scripts. You then wrote and appeared in the TV comedy series Twice a Fortnight alongside Pythons, Michael Palin and Terry Jones and goodies Graham Garden and Bill Oddie. Now, what set this show apart from the other review type programs of the day? I don't know that anything did. Um, it was uh, written by Bill and Graham almost entirely. And uh, I'd worked with Bill on Cambridge Circus and with Graham when we were both university students. Um, and they very kindly asked me to be in it and Timbrook Taylor. Uh, we all knew each other from Cambridge. Um, and uh, it was the same kind of crazy humor as the Pythons, although the Pythons came later and, and were more successful. I think Twice a Fortnight didn't quite work because we had a director producer who wanted to rev the audience up into a state of hysteria every week. And so they shouted and screamed. And instead of just sitting there and waiting to be to laugh at something funny. Um, <laughs> so so uh, uh, it, the show didn't wholly work, but it was interesting to do. 
You also contributed scripts to the long-running ITV sitcom Doctor in the House. Now, why do you think this became a testing ground for so many of Britain's most prolific writers? I don't know that it did exactly. Um, the producer was Humphrey Barclay, who had been at Cambridge with us all. He asked Graham Chapman and John Cleese to write on it, but Graham Chapman was a doctor. Um, he asked Graham Gardner and Bill Oddie to write it. Also, there's another writing team. Graham Garden is a doctor. Um, and uh, I started writing for it later. I was in the show, and uh, an actor, another actor in the show, George Layton, uh, wanted to write. And I, by this time, I decided that I wanted to write. And so one week, when one of the other teams of writers didn't come up with a script, um, George discovered that and said, why don't we try and write one? So we pitched a story to Humphrey Barclay and he liked it and we wrote the script and we had beginner's luck. It was a very funny script. Um, partly that was we had, we hit the nail on the head because we were both had been in the series. George was still in it and I had been in it. And so we knew the characters really well. Um, and after that we got lucky. Um, because there's a shortage of people who can write a funny script on cue, as it were. So we became a successful comedy writing pair. Um, but I don't think it was Doctor in the House that achieved that for anybody else. I think the others were all um, already working writers. Okay. I think Josh has got another question. <laughs> Josh has just asked, how easy is it to write with somebody else? That's an interesting question. In some ways it's much easier because uh, a half-formed idea is useful. You know, you can come up with a, a line and with thinking there must be a funny rejoinder to this and somebody or your partner comes up with it. Um, sometimes it's better because if you're stuck on a storyline, your partner may come up with with an answer. Two heads are better than one, as they say. Mm. On the other hand, you have it only works if you're really prepared to put your ego on one side. In other words, you have, mustn't care who wrote which line, who got the most jokes that week, who was funnier that week. Um, sometimes one of you does more work, sometimes another of you does, depending on how how things are. And as I was always very grateful if my co-writer, I've written with two people, George Layton and then Anthony Jay, I was always very grateful if my co-writer came up with a better line than I came up with, or a better idea than I came up with. It's just easier that way and quicker. It's interesting comparing your career with your future sitcom co-writer, Anthony Jay, with Jay being integral to the continuing development, uh, the continuing developing monologue of the Frost Report, while you were among the future Pythons in Twice a Fortnight. How did this similar grounding bring the two of you together? I wasn't um, a future Python. I was never a part of Monty Python. Um, but you were among the future Pythons in Twice a Fortnight, sorry. Well, yes, yeah, going way back, we all knew each other from university. Mm. Um, so it wasn't t twice a fortnight that did that. It was, you know, we went back some years before that. Um, how did Tony and I get together? Was that the question? Uh, how did Ant uh, you and Anthony J uh, get together? Yes. Um, he, uh, I met uh, Tony J through John Cleese. Uh, he, he and John knew each other from the Frost Report. Um, Tony had always wanted to, he was head of talks and features at the BBC and then he became a freelance writer. And he wanted to start a company uh, that made management training films. Uh, he saw a gap in the market. People, all corporations all over Britain had training departments with a substantial budget and all they could do was rent very really boring films from the rank organizations showing how you do a job right. 
Tony had the inspiration that if you show people doing a job wrong, it'll be funnier. Hmm. So he talked to John about that. And they started this company, and John phoned me and said he was starting this company with a chap called Tony J. And would I act in the first film for a deferred fee? And I said, of course. I was terribly sorry for John. I thought, has it come to this poor man that he's now making management training films? How wrong it was. And the company started with 4,000 bucks of Tony's money and, and was sold 17 years later for over 50 million. Um, which John, you know, had a share. But anyway, I didn't know all that. <laughs> and uh, so uh, t I met Tony that way on the first day of that shoot. And then I was asked to act in the next two. And by that time, I knew Tony. And when John went off to write Faulty Towers, Tony needed new writers to work with him on these management training films. And I was one. And Dennis Norton was another. And um, that's... Um, that's how we started writing together, and I think I wrote about 20 films of video arts. And then at that point, we started work on Yes, Minister. Mm. Now, the satirical comedy Yes, Minister. What inspired you to write something so? What inspired you to write something so satirical? Uh, that's always been the kind of writing I did uh, when I was writing Doctor in the House and Doctor in Charge, or all that sort of stuff. I was always looking for slightly satirical storylines. Um, and um, in this case, Tony had this idea that we should write a series about what really happened in Whitehall, in the corridors of power, which I thought was a rather dull idea. And um, I said no, and went off to direct in the theatre for two or three years. I became director of a theatre company. And then after a while, I wanted to write. And I phoned Tony and I said, did you, uh, you, did you do, ever do anything with that idea? And he said, no, I didn't. Do you want to now? So I said, well, let's try. So we started the searching. We met people who were in government. Uh, Tony knew some people from his work as a political journalist. Um, I knew one or two academics, and I was, we're both always been very interested in government. And... Um, um, it came out satirically because really that's the only way to do comedy about politics. Actually, it wasn't really about politics, it was about government, but you know, still, it, it, it was automatically satirical. Now, Paul Eddington was already a big star in Britain, thanks to his portrayal of Jerry Leadbetter in the, in the Good Life. So what extent was this vital to the show's initial success? I have no idea if that had any bearing on it or not. Uh, people are successful in one series and then later not so successful in another. I don't think that had much to do with it. What it, what it, what Paul's contribution was was a wonderful performance. Um, I don't think it was a question of a star name. I think it was that he and Nigel and Derek Fold were also brilliant in the parts we wrote for them, and. Um, I think, you know, that was obviously a huge part of the success. Casting is terribly important. You know, our, our script might not have been funny done by other people. No. Um, in 1986, Jim Hacker made his inevitable route to number 10 in Yes, Prime Minister. To what extent was this a much needed payoff to the series? Well, it wasn't so much a payoff as we had finished in 1984. We'd done 21 episodes of Yes Minister, and we didn't really want to do any more. We felt we said everything we wanted to say about government at that point. Um, then what happened uh, was that the BBC kept saying to us, well, will we write more? And we kept saying no. <laughs> and um, after a couple of years, Bill Cotton, who was managing director of television, got us to a meeting and said, what will it take? And we said, well, part of the fact we're paying a great deal of money, um, because you'll be paying us really badly, mm -hmm. <laughs> badly. Um, part of that, what we said was, we said everything we can say about government when it's about a Minister of Administrative Affairs, which is what Jim Haggard's job was. But if we move into number 10, then we can talk about 
defence and foreign policy and all the things that Jim Hacker had nothing to do with. Yeah. So that's why we moved him to number 10. And uh, we made a deal with Bill that day that he would write a Christmas special, which he somehow got to number 10. We didn't know how at that point. And then we'd write two eight-episode series with Yes Prime Minister. And after that, I think they wanted us to carry on. But once again, we decided we'd said what we had to say. Yeah. Josh has just asked, why was it eight episodes and not six? Why what? Why, why was it eight episodes a series? Josh just asked. It actually wasn't, it was seven. Um, oh. the three, it was seven for the first three years, and then after that it was eight. Mm. I don't know, I think it brought up to some total that they felt they could sell everywhere. I think including the, our Christmas special that came to 39 half hours, and that was in some way something that was important to the BBC. The use of linguistic dexterity and wordplay was an important part of the series. Now, as a writer, how difficult is it to insert these elements whilst maintaining individual character voices? I think that was the, the individual character voice of both Sir Humphrey, Bernard and Jim. I think they spoke in their own characters. Um, Humphrey's job as he saw it, was to try and evade questions from the minister whenever possible, because he thought he was a fool. So he liked to dress things up in language, and, and we to just make, create a kind of a very, a very inflated version of civil service jargon, which he spoke. Um, Bernard Woolley was um, was a very pedantic young man, and, um, and he loved language. He liked puns. I mean, like, I mean, he was a classicist, so he always could find some Latin or Greek um, way of looking at things. Um, Jim spoke like a politician, you know, full of political cliches. Uh, so really all the language was character-based, we thought. But of course, it, you know, it, it doesn't mean that if you're writing characters with very specific backgrounds, you want the language to reflect that. Now, beyond TV comedy, you've also directed comedy films such as Nuns on the Run, My Cousin Vinny, and The Fighting Temptations. How different are the disciplines of writing for the, from the omnipotent world of direction? Well, um, I've written several screenplays. I wrote, start, the first thing I ever wrote was called The Internecine Project. It was rewritten when it was made changed in a way I didn't like, but that was actually my first writing credit as a screenplay. Um, that wasn't a comedy, that was a thriller about a CIA. Um, and then Nuns on the Run I wrote as well as directed, and Clue I wrote and directed. Um, it, how is it different? It's only different in that it's not different at all really. It's, it's um, you're looking for a good storyline, you're looking for characters that make sense of that storyline. As Graham Greene famously said, character is plot, so you know the plot has to be in some way um, interconnected with character. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes you see scripts where it's just the, the plotting is so mechanical, it doesn't really matter who the characters are. Um, and um, the Fighting Temptations I didn't write, um, so I didn't have anything to do with writing with that. That's, that's a largely black cast, and I certainly didn't feel equipped to write for those characters. There was a really good black writer called Saladin Patterson who wrote that cast. Um, I don't know what else I can say about that. No, that's fine. How, how do you find switching between the two disciplines of writing and directing? Uh, to me, they're really all the same thing. They're storytelling. Uh, when I direct, I almost invariably add some material of my own. I mean, because uh, I don't think I've ever been handed a script which to direct, which was ready to shoot. 
except maybe once, um, a film called Greedy, which was written by Lowell Ganson, Babalu Mandel, Michael J. Fox and Kirk Douglas were in it in the end. And, um, and that script I didn't, you didn't change at all, I don't think. But apart from that, uh, I think we've always adjusted scripts according to either, either the needs of the characters or to make them funnier uh, or, um, or the needs of the production. In other words, when I made a film called The Whole Nine Yards with Bruce Willis, Matthew Perry, the producer made a deal to shoot it in Miami. No, sorry, it was said in Miami. He'd made a deal to shoot it in Montreal. Well, Montreal looks nothing like Miami. It's far north, it's cold, it's a city. Uh, <laughs> they couldn't be more different. So in the end, the only way to solve that problem was to reset the film in Montreal. Because you couldn't shoot Miami there. You no. couldn't take that. So often the needs of production demand changes in the script. Um, sometimes the needs of casting demand changes in the script. Looking back at your career, what is your proudest achievement? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, well, I think I would have to give a few answers. It's all right. I don't pick one thing. I, I'm proud of my cousin Vinny. I think it's a very successful movie. I'm proud of um, Yes Prime Minister, Yes Minister, of course. I'm very proud of some of my books, of my new novel, Samaritans, which came out last year. Um, I'm very pleased with um, you know, I, 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 I write for all different media. And people know me really for the work I've done on screen. Um, I was very proud of some of my productions in London at the National Theatre. So, um, I don't think I can give an answer to that. I think, um, really, it's not for me to judge which of what I've done, which is best and which isn't best. I've done one or two films that I don't particularly think are necessarily very good and other people really love. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I think audiences, you know, need to make up their own minds. True. And uh, what's next for Jonathan Lynn? Uh, well, I've written a couple of new plays that I hope will be seen in London, well, in England, possibly in London in the next year or so. Mm. Um... There's a film I'm trying to set up at the moment, which I'll shoot in Britain sometime next year, I hope. Um, but I'm getting on a bit, and I'm, you know, I'm, I, I, I do less, and if I do much less, I don't really mind. So we'll see. Take it as it comes. Take it as it comes. That's what I've always done. I never had a career plan or anything. I just, if something came up, I tended to do it. Thank you to our guest for being the subject of another Beyond the Title interview. If you liked this, why not browse the website and see if there's anything else that takes your fancy. Don't forget to like our Facebook page to receive updates on forthcoming interviews and to see more information about me and what I do. Thanks again and hopefully see you next time.